Okay, if this next section uh, is going to look at the, uh, the question of was the Iraq war legal? And uh, we'll hear in this section, I'm going to change my role slightly and try and give evidence to the panel as uh, an expert in the laws of war. And I would expect them to question me on any of that that doesn't come across clearly. Uh, James will also uh, question it. And uh, we're also going to have a look at some of the uh, issues from the United Nations General Assembly, Resolution 2625, which is the present law relating to the United Nations Charter and activities of countries under the United Nations Charter. So we'll get going on that. And what I'd like to do is talk to you a bit about the was the Iraq war legal? I'll do it from here because I'm doing it as a, an expert witness. Uh, I'm referring to... Show, could you first tell us uh, what your, uh, about your expertise, please? Yeah, thanks. Um, I have... Uh, I was originally a management consultant and a businessman, entrepreneur and other things. In uh, 1998, I discovered started to investigate corruption in the British government and discovered that there was corrupt practice in virtually every department I looked at. In 2002, I was looking at the Foreign and Commonwealth Office and realized that what was being said about the legality of the war with Afghanistan at that time didn't accord with my understanding of the law, which caused me then to start to investigate what were the laws of war. Uh, and really, I have been investigating the laws of war ever since. So, uh, in 2003, before the Iraq war uh, started, I tried to get an injunction against the Prime Minister and the British government to force them to stop the invasion of Iraq. But unfortunately, at our high court, that was unsuccessful. And I have been uh, working on the laws of war ever since. Okay. Right, I'm going to refer to the documentation, was the Iraq war legal? So if you have a look at that, I'll, I'll go through some of the key phrases and sentences and parts of that uh, document. Um, sorry, before you do that, could you just uh, clarify what the general understanding is um, of war crimes, uh, you know, a definition of war crimes, and maybe a, a definition Yes, I'm using the term... Broadly, I'm using the term in two different ways. There's a general term of war crimes, which really covers every crime that is committed during a war uh, with war as its excuse. And there are at least 35, 36 different criminal offences <coughs> under that category. Now, there's the second use of the term war crimes, which is quite specific to and I'll come to it in a minute, the Geneva Conventions and the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. And I'll be referring to that in a minute. So I'm using it, first of all, in the general term of any crime that is committed during the war, and then we'll come to the specific war crimes that are detailed in the Geneva Conventions a little bit later. Is that all right? Yes. Take it down your article, uh, and first of all, I'm going to go through what the laws are, and then we'll have a look at how they're applied or misapplied, that's okay. So, uh, if you turn to the uh, third, fourth page, it's headed by international laws govern the use of armed force. And there's a list there of the main international laws of war. The first of them is the Treaty for the Renunciation of War in 1928 called the Calabrian Pact. And this prohibits resort to war and requires that all disputes are settled peacefully. Now that I believe to be the single most important law the world has ever passed. And in my investigations over the last eight years, I can't find a single member of the British government who even knows that they exist. <coughs> It was passed in 1928 because of the horror of the First World War, where millions <coughs> died, and Aristide Briand, the French Foreign Minister, and Frank Kellogg, the Secretary of State for America, 
uh, decided to free men to organize an international agreement never ever to go to war again. That agreement still pertains. And the reason why it's important really is that it formed the basis of the Nuremberg War Crimes trials after the Second World War. Germany's leaders were convicted of 11 breaches of the Kellogg-Briand Pact when they invaded 11 other and occupied 11 other countries. And it is that action of invading and occupying another country that we want to draw attention to for this uh, war with Iraq. That is exactly the same crime that Hitler and his colleagues committed in uh, 1940, and 40, when they walked into European countries. The same crime was committed here by the British and American uh, armed forces when they walked into Iraq, invaded and occupied Iraq. They did the same with Afghanistan, and I have to say, a similar crime was committed with Libya. Anyway, that's the single most important war law that does apply right now, and uh, Britain was a signatory in the very first place. There's a long list of them there. The UN Charter, the Nuremberg War Crimes Trials, which is the customary international war law, the Geneva Conventions, the Genocide Convention, the Nuremberg Principles. And finally, right at the bottom, the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, 1998. Now, I believe this to be the most important international war law. It is tighter and more detailed than any war law we've ever had before. And there are now 114 nations signed up to this. And it incorporates the crimes of genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes, as defined in this Rome Statute, as universal criminal offences applicable all around the world. Um, however, some nations have not agreed to... Uh, be bound by that, and in particular America. Although they signed up initially to the Rome Statute uh, when Bush came into power, they have since then done all they can to get other nations to de-ratify it and to get out of it. And they have gone around the world trying to ensure it is not applied and cannot be applied to American citizens. Uh, um, just before I go on, I'll just um, mention the Genocide Convention 1948. The reason why we will later on today focus on genocide is that it is the one crime that we can hold American leaders to account for under American law. The original convention was passed in 1948. And for some 20 years, a Senator, William Proxmire, stood up in Congress and tried to persuade Congress to ratify the Genocide Convention. After 19 years of trying, he succeeded. In 1988, President Reagan signed the Genocide Convention Implementation Act, which has later become known as the Proxmire Act. The reason why this is so important is that if we can prove genocide has occurred in Iraq and that it was a joint operation of the British and American troops, the evidence that we gather today and in all uh, court cases associated with genocide can be directly applied in America, under American law, to prosecute George Bush, Dick Cheney and all the others associated with the attack on Iraq. That is a quick rundown of the international laws governing the use of armed force and war. Um, just to clarify, uh, the UK has ratified the Rome Statute. Correct? It has indeed, and I'll come right on to that right now. Um, and under Prime Minister Tony Blair? Absolutely. If you turn the page, you'll see which British laws govern the use of armed force. And the first one there is the International Criminal Court Act 2001. Now that is exactly the same wording of the crime, the crimes as the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. What happened was that um, nations who signed the original uh, 
a Greek statute. They only really take effect in those nations when they brought it into their domestic law. And we brought it in <coughs> September 2001. The important thing is that it introduces the crime, the criminal offences under the law of England and Wales of genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, conduct ancillary to genocide, conduct ancillary to crimes against humanity, and conduct ancillary to war crimes. Six criminal offences which are the worst criminal offences in law. What was interesting was that it came in on the 1st of uh, September, it became in force on the 1st of September 2001, and on the 7th of October, Tony Blair breached it when he invaded and occupied uh, Afghanistan, started the war with Afghanistan. But nobody has been held to account for it, and that's one of the things that we want to try and do in this court. The other uh, British law I will uh, draw attention to is at the bottom of that list. It's called the Accessories and Abettors Act 1861. Now, the reason why that is important is that it applies to every British citizen. If we, as a nation, wage a war and our leaders commit the crime of genocide, and we pay for that as taxpayers, we are automatically committing a crime of aiding and abetting genocide. And under the law of England and Wales, that is a crime of conduct ancillary to genocide, as it is defined in section 52 of the International Criminal Court Act. It applies to everybody who has paid any tax of any form since the invasion of Afghanistan on October the 7th, 2001. I will therefore show that every British taxpayer who has paid tax of any sort in the last 10 years has unwittingly committed the crime of conduct and ancillary to genocide. And we need to do something about that. I'll come to that later. Um, can I, do you know of the War Crimes Act of 1991? Yes. And is that relevant? <clears throat> no, it's totally redundant. It was brought in by Mrs. Thatcher in order to try to prosecute certain aging uh, concentration camp guards from the Second World War. Uh, and it was worded in such a way that it could not apply to Mrs. Thatcher, who had just committed oh. the war crime uh, against the um, Argentinian Navy when she sank the Belgrana. That was, in international law, a major war crime. However, she had organised for the wording of the War Crimes Act 1991 to exclude her and any other British citizens. I think I'd like to move on, if I may, to when and in what circumstances is war lawful. It is quite crucial that there is an assumption with London and the rest of the world, in fact, that war is sometimes justified. That is absolutely wrong. Since 1928, war has been illegal, universally illegal throughout the world. And it's summed up well by that statement by Henry Stinson, who was the USA Secretary of State, 1932. War between nations was renounced by the signatories of the Kellogg-Briand Treaty. This means that it has become, throughout practically the entire world, an illegal thing. Hereafter, when nations engage in armed conflict, either one or both of them must be termed violators of this general treaty law. We denounce them as law breakers. That is uh, really sums up international law in relation to war. Um, I also like to just refer to one or two of the um, quotations from the judgment of the Nuremberg War Crimes Tribunal. You'll see it at the bottom of the same page. After the signing of the pact, any nation resorting to war as an instrument of national policy breaks the pact. In the opinion of the Tribunal, the solemn renunciation of war as an instrument of national policy 
necessarily involves the proposition that such war is illegal in international law, and that those who plan and wage such a war with its inevitable and terrible consequences are committing a crime in so doing. Now it seems to me that that is quite clear. The use of language is absolutely clear. The charges in the indictment that the defendants planned and waged aggressive wars are charges of the utmost gravity. War is essentially an evil thing. Its consequences are not confined to the belligerent states alone, but affect the whole world. To initiate a war of aggression, therefore, is not only an international crime, it is the supreme international crime, differing only from other war crimes, in that it contains within itself the accumulated evil of the whole. That came from the judgment of the Nuremberg War Crimes Tribunal. Broadly then, that's the, the law of war, and within that there are a number of uh, subcomponents. We'll come to them later. Um, I'd also just like to quickly refer to the United Nations Charter, because the, this is now the, I suppose, the primary source of law uh, in the world, and governs what we, every nation does in relation to every other nation. It was signed in 1945, and every nation who signed up to the United <coughs> Nations agrees to do a number of things. And it's important they are mentioned here under 2.3 and 2.4. These are the purposes of the United Nations and the agreements they make. All members.